Bwana usemu yangu rafiki yangu wewe katika safari yangu tatembea na wewe pamoja na wewe pamoja Katika safari yangu tatembea na wewe niongoze safari ni mbele unichukue mlango ni mwambinguni ni Pamoja na wewe Pamoja na wewe Mlango ni mwambinguni ningie na wewe Lord we declare that even though you are a king you're still our brother and you are our friend and right now as we begin this broadcast we ask you to come and take your most high place. We ask you to come and instruct us even through the blood of the Lamb, even as we come before your holy presence and sit at your feet. Lord, I offer my members unto you, O Lord Jehovah God. Take a call, touch my lips, O God, and cleanse them. Let the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, be found acceptable even unto you, O Lord God, my God and my King. And Lord, we ask that not a word would be uttered on this broadcast that will not glorify you, but also that every word that proceeds out of my mouth would not be a word out of my mouth, O oh God, which is a fallen mouth, which is, O oh God, a mouth that is prone to wonder, O oh Lord Jehovah God. But by your grace and by the blood of Jesus is a sanctified mouth, O oh God, and a mouthpiece for you, O oh God. So take my mouth, Lord, take the words that flow out of it, O oh God. Take the feelings, take the anointing, O oh God. Let it be all of you, O oh Lord Jehovah, King of glory. Use it for your glory. Let it come directly from the throne of mercy and grace. Lord, instruct us this fine morning, O oh Lord Jehovah God, even as we sit at your feet. Lord, our desire is to do your will, O oh Lord Jehovah God. Father, we proclaim this day even as we fast and call upon your name, O oh God, that we desire that would please you. We desire, O oh God, that will bring you glory and we desire, O oh God, that you would be made known to all, O oh Lord God, and that the Son of God would be lifted high. We exalt you, Jesus, as a King of kings, the one who was and is and is to come, the one who came, O oh God, through the Virgin Mary, O oh Lord God, who was birthed, O oh God, through a virgin King of glory and became flesh, and you dwelt amongst us, O oh God, and that you were crucified, you died, and you were buried, and on the third day you rose again, and you are ascended, seated on the right hand side of the Father Almighty, making it essential for us and preparing a room for us that one day we will be with you. We also acknowledge that you're the one who is in heaven as well as on earth and everywhere, oh God, for you are the omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent Jehovah, King of glory, and we thank you that you never leave us nor forsake us. We love you, Lord, and as we continue to surrender to you our wounds, Lord, we ask that the wounds will not be glorified, but the Lord will be glorified, and we ask that the saints of God will not hurt so much as God to get caught up in the wounds and to feel as though they are at a disadvantage but to know that you have come that we may have life and life abundantly and that Lord God by the stripes of Jesus we are made whole and indeed it's even for these wounds that you died and that you were wounded for our iniquities you were wounded because we have been wounded and therefore Lord Jesus because of you you have taken every wound upon yourself and today we are made whole it's one of the miracles of loving you and of following you in Jesus mighty name Whew, amen hallelujah I love prayer and it's just the most beautiful thing i can get lost in the presence of god i love his presence and i love to love him and i love to glorify him and i just love to lift his name up high this morning as i went before the throne of mercy i the lord said to me come just as you are and i realized that i have a tendency that when i go before the presence of god the first thing i'm checking for is Am I fallen? Am I walking with him? Am I right? Am I welcome? You know, and as as I you know um, just um, 
gave that to the Lord. The Lord said to me, speak to my children about this thing because you've been working with me for a long time, but it continues to be a thing that happens to you when you come to the place of prayer. And one of the desires of my heart that I keep praying to the Lord for is, Lord, I don't want to come to you because I have a problem. I don't want to come to you because I need your intervention. I don't want to come to you because I need something from you. I want to come to you because you're a friend and I want to spend time with you. And, and that's been the cry of my heart. And as I've thought about people who've grown and their ministries have increased and, you know, um, they've been blessed and, you know, they're doing well in every form and way. People who've gone especially um, to other nations that have progressed and everything. As I think about it, one thing that I find in common in all those cases, especially for those who have walked away from the Lord, is that the Lord has been about and their relationship with God has been about what they need from God. And that's a very dangerous thing. When we are at a place where we pray, when we have problems, but when we don't have problems, we don't pray. It's a very human thing too, by the way. We are prone to wonder and we are prone to serve God and pursue God um, based on our issues and our challenges. I remember speaking to a man in Nestle. Sorry, guys. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Incoming. I forgot to transfer um, um, the incoming calls. So I remember talking to a man in Netherlands and um, he shared with me about how I'd, I'd said that um, a lot of times we are interested in God and we, we want to seek God and we want to pursue God only when we have problems, but when we don't have problems that it actually, you know, we forget about God. And like I said, in Holland, it's been many years uh, since they last had a war. And he says that during the war, people were prayerful, the churches were full and everything. But since there was last a war, um, people have not really been going to church. And that's the fact about a lot of Europe. And I think this man really gave me insight as well into things. You know, um, someone was telling me about how um, their, their, a friend of theirs went to China and moved to China. And, and she said, you know, they don't really pray much uh, because um, when they, you know, in China, there's so much progression. I've not been to China, by the way. I really desire to go but um it's one of the nations that i know the lord will send me to with time but a lot of times a lot of us we go to you know we, we, we when we go to places like those and i did share about my experience with america the first time that i went there we relax and um you know it looks like everything's working um you know it's unlikely that you're going to get sick. And if you get sick, uh, you know, the institutions work very well. And so it's very, very easy to get caught up in. And if you work, you're going to get money. And if you're brilliant and you're hardworking, you're going to get rich, guaranteed, you know. Unlike here in Africa, and especially, you know, not all of Africa, but some of Africa, and Kenya happens to be one of them, where really prayer is about being sustained and about living and about you know just making it through that you know um as we head to as january and in january a lot of us will be more prayerful because you know we really need school fees we need a breakthrough we've blown our money during christmas time and really we've lived outside of our budgets and we need god to come through for us we are very very prayerful maybe it's christmas time as well so we'll go and pray more and everything so just going back to that as i was meditating upon this phenomenon um, I also found the Lord taking me back again to childhood, you know, and the Lord said, you're not done ministering about wounds. And so many of you have contacted me and told me how this wounds um, um, series has really impacted on your life. But I'm a bit concerned that a lot of you are talking about the pain, you know, the pain and, and how it hurts and how you've realized that, you know, you grew up in this and this really affected you, etc., etc. And it's a good thing that the Lord has revealed that to you. However, we need to be aware that the Lord reveals so that he can redeem. So once the Lord has revealed to us, let us weep, let us mourn before the Lord indeed, because we've realized that something is hurting us. We've realized that this thing is affecting us. Of course, you know, with the memory comes a lot of pain. And um, that's what Satan really uses at the end of the day, um, so that it's too painful for you to deal with. But we must then get to the next level where we get over the pain and we get over the wounds and we recover and we get out of them. And I have shared how to do this, but I'll repeat it again. So what you deal with, the Lord talks about in the word of God about uprooting things. For whenever you're dealing with things and you're just, you know, shearing, you know, cutting the leaves off or pruning or whatever it is, you're actually pruning. That's what it is. You're pruning. Uh, but when you allow the Lord 
to, to, to help you to deal with those things and to find the root of those things and where the pain comes from and what the enemy has been using, then what you do is that you uproot. And if you uproot something from its roots, it can never grow again. But when you prune it, then it will grow, okay? So you need to be able to begin to learn with every spiritual problem, with every issue, you need to learn to get to the root of it. And you will not get to the root of it by yourself. You need to rely on the Holy Spirit who is our helper. And the Bible says that he reveals to us the things of God. He was there since before time, so he knows. He knows every situation. He's also called the witness because he witnesses things and he sees things. So therefore, he can come and help you and give you a witness account of things. So we need to learn to walk with him and to work with the Holy Spirit. So when you realize that something is hurting you deeply, when you realize that something affects you deeply in prayer, and a lot of times we recommend fasting too because it helps dead things to float, then you enter the presence of God and you ask him to show you what is the root of this pain? What is the root of this behavior? What is the root of this belief? Every time you will find that there is a wound. So Satan operates with wounds. If he can wound you, then he will introduce a lie through the wound. And then once he introduces the lie, then actually it's the other way around. Every time I say it, the Holy Spirit corrects me on this. So if the Holy Spirit will introduce a lie, then through the lie, he will introduce the wound and then through the wound. But sometimes he can do it also the other way around. Really, I'm getting the sense of that because sometimes the wound will be what? You'll be raped. And when you're raped, Satan will then introduce the lie. Then what is the lie? The lie will be that you deserved it, that it was your fault, that you're dad wasn't there to protect you and then when you're older you will think that it's going to happen to you so you always take precautions and you always have a wall guarding you and you don't rely fully on father god to be able to protect you because at that moment you also believed he wasn't there and you don't, didn't even take time to understand what happened and how could he allow this to happen and that's how satan really works in our lives so we always have to be able to and then sometimes it will be that he operates the other way around he'll introduce a lie so for example whenever uh, someone will use abusive language towards you whether it's your spouse who tells you how useless you are who tells you how fat you've gotten who tells you how you'll never make it who tells you maybe it's other it's a woman who's telling you that other men are better or they're comparing you to other men who are doing well and tells you you're a useless man you you can't do it you can't make it then what's happening there is that or maybe it's a boss who's telling you how you're very lucky that they hired you and they're telling you how they'll fire you and what they're doing is that they are introducing to you wounds okay so they are, they, are, they are introducing a lie, then once they lie to you, so this is how it works the other reverse way. So the earlier example was where a wound is used to then introduce a, introduce a lie. But in this case now, it's a lie being used to introduce a wound. So a lie is thrown at you and you begin to believe the lie. And before you know it, you have believed the lie and you're actually wounded. And what happens is that either you're wounding other people in return or you are walking in a lie where you are not able to enjoy um, John 10, 10 of life and life abundantly. Remember that Satan comes to kill, to steal, but, and to destroy, okay? Okay? to steal please note the words to steal to kill to destroy and not even the order you know scripture is very very deliberate even how things are written yeah so to steal so he will steal the truth from you he will steal your peace he will steal your joy and by the way please remember the joy of the lord is your strength so when your joy is taken away suddenly you will feel weak you feel tired you feel exhausted and it's purely that satan has succeeded in stealing your joy sorry incoming he will steal he will kill he will destroy, okay? So he will steal, then after that he will kill. So anything, so he will steal whatever it is, you know, steal the front that you're operating on. He will steal the ground that you're operating on. He will steal what you have believed in, the word and everything. He will steal all that. And then what he will do is that he will kill. So that he makes sure that there's no life that is existing in you. There is no life that is existing, existing in what you have believed in. And please note, even with this example comes things like what? Whenever you look at a situation where somebody has back Sleden, first they will forsake the fellowship of brethren so they stop going to church maybe they get a job where they're working on Sundays and everything and we need to be principled by the way beloved so that then we know the day of the Sabbath if you're in Arabian countries it will be on a Friday and you know you know that this is your Sabbath day and you protect it you know there's no amount of dollar there's no amount of of, 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 of shekel there's no amount of shilling there's no amount of pound that can replace 
uh, the fellowship of brethren. So he will steal your time of fellowship. And then uh, what he will do from there is you will find yourself too tired to pray. And then you're not reading the word of God. And you're suddenly, uh, you know, kind of isolated and everything. Because Satan also works with the divide and rule approach. And then after that, he will kill uh, whatever life was in you in terms of the faith in God, the belief in God, the holding on to God, <coughs> and the things of God. And then after that, he'll begin a process of destroying your life, yeah? So steal, kill, destroy. John 10, 10. But on the other side is what the Lord Jesus has offered. He has said, I have come. The, in fact, he says, I am come, okay? I am come. The, new, the King James Version, I am come. You know, I am here. I am here. I am present. And then he says, so that you may have life. And then life abundantly, you know. Uh, his divine power has given us every need also for life and for, for, for godliness, okay. So life, life, life. So the life is in the blood. The life is in the blood. The life is in the word of God. The life is in the word of truth. The life is in the fellowship. The word, life is in Jesus Christ. And on this very same thing, one of the things that Satan will do is he will steal um, your faith in, in God uh, that you need to get born again. And I've met people who by all means and ways, their behavior is so Christian. They know the Christianese. They know the language. They speak like they're Christians. But I can't feel the presence of God in them. So I ask them, are you really born again? And the person says, well, 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 you know, because if you ask them very directly, people cannot really confirm that they are born again. So they tell you, oh, well, you know, I'm an SDA. Oh, well, I'm a Catholic. Oh, you know, um, yes, you know, and then they'll give another excuse and give you religion. And what you know is that Jesus is not their savior and their, their king. And they walk in the so in this case, Satan has stolen their faith that you have to give your life to Christ, that you have to repent, that you have to take a moment and ask Jesus to come into your life and to be your Savior and your Lord. And he has killed their belief that they really need to be in that faith and walk with God and, and that they, you can only receive some things through the cross of Jesus Christ. And then, of course, finally, he destroys their ability to give their lives to Jesus because after some time, everybody receives them as though they are Christians because they they speak everybody believes they are christians a lot of us don't move with discernment we believe the words we hear we believe what we see and we don't listen out for the presence of god in people because if you're born again there will be a presence of god in your life and in your heart so it's very sudden but it's a phenomenon that's really coming up especially amongst us kenyans we have just learned how to speak like we are born again we've been around christian friends and we are learning christianese we are learning to even quote scripture we are learning to say by the grace of God. We're learning to say, yes, in Jesus' name, you know, we rebuke that in Jesus' name. We bind it in Jesus' name. And you will find by there this person is even in an illicit affair. They are actually in a relationship where maybe even they're even with somebody's husband, you know, and yet they're there quoting in the name of Jesus and all those things. Eh? It's, it's really, really dangerous. So how do we connect this then to our childhood wounds? Um, so the Lord began to speak to me and I remembered something. How I grew up, um, uh, you know, as one of the youngest children in, in my family. And growing up, the introduction that I received was when dad comes home, whenever you hear him hooting, we would take turns. We had like an agreement on whose turn it was to go and open the gate. Of course, as we grew, you know, we were the younger ones, my, my little sister and I. So we are the ones who would go and open um, the door, the gate pretty much. But the older ones really would flee to the bedroom. And uh, it became a thing. So you'd go, you open the gate and then you run to the bedroom and you go and hide in the bedroom and keep to yourself in the bedroom, etc. And if you were called, um, you always found yourself checking yourself and wondering, am I okay? Did I do anything? You know, you'd be trying to play through your diary and directory the whole day of, you know, as you're going, of course, you have to respond very quickly and go. You had to shout yes when you were called. You didn't just appear. You know, my children do a thing that I'm getting used to where I call them and they don't answer and then they appear, you know. So I've called like five times and then finally somebody appears. And I find it so weird, but it's like a thing that children do these days or maybe it's a thing of somewhere else. But when we were called, you shouted and, and they said, yes, I'm coming, you know, and then you went. And then when you got there, there's a way, there's a posture you stood with and you waited to be told what it is that you are called for. Then you'd be called and part of the relief would be when the, the parent would turn to you and they don't, you know, they don't look at you with an angry look and uh, you'd be, anything else was acceptable, you know. And I remember for my dad in particular, if I did something um, or we had done something, 
if it was really serious, you'd be told to sit down. And if you were told to sit down, you'd know, bah, it's over. You're in so much trouble. And of course, you'd pick the farthest couch from, from him, you know, and then um, just look down and be very sorry. And, you know, Yani, we repented before we were even uh, dealt with. Uh, for whatever it is and then um, of course you wouldn't argue you'd have to agree with everything and then after that uh, you would then um, know what your con the consequences of your your, your mistake are um, sometimes if it wasn't so big or if it was he was very very angry you know you'd stand there and then you begin to be lectured and you know he would speak very slowly and you would do this you know I, I I never want to you know or you'd be asked a question who did you what 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 I remember one time by the way you know and this was now my mom um, I just finished fourth form and um, I met this lady um, and uh, no actually I, I, I met this lady and she invited me for an Opus Dei meeting at that time um, you know I was still Catholic I'd been born again but I was still Catholic and I was still really really looking for God and she told me about Opus Dei and she invited me for Opus Dei and I was like oh okay Sasa maybe you know I'll find the depth of God that I've been looking for that I've not been able to find so I went to the Opus Dei center um, just uh, where was it now I don't even remember i think near mamlaka or something like that i don't even remember where it was or was it near kanda so i went to the opus day center they took me around i just remember the darkness in the place and thinking why is it so dark or is it so you know there was just a very uncomfortable presence and then um, finally they took me to a place where they said oh by the way you like languages yes we have spanish i even sat down for a spanish class but after some time, I started to get very uncomfortable and to feel very, very weird. So, of course, I fled. And then uh, she called me. Those days we had landlines. So she called me and she says, uh, you know, um, uh, I was wondering why you're not coming for our meetings, why you've not been coming to class, etc. And they follow up. Eh? And I remember I, I came up with a lie. So I said, you know, my aunt died. So we've just been having the funeral process. I don't know why I thought that if someone dies, it's forever, you know, like, like uh, we'll never get out of it and she'll never call me again. And, you know, I'm bereaved, man, you know. So I remember one day mom calling me and I was really in trouble with mom like that. I mean, mom would just wait until when you're showering and they should pinch you in the bathroom, you know, so you couldn't run out naked. So hers was a little simpler to deal with. It was then then she'll be pinching you as she's asking you why you did whatever whatever so um she called me and she asked me who died so i said i'm sorry what do you mean who died and she said um i i asked her what do you mean yeah what do you mean who died so i said well um I don't know what you're talking about. So she said, who died? So I said, I don't know who died. You tell me. And then she says, which one? Is it my sister or your father's sister who died? So I'm looking at her very, very blankly. Because you know, the thing is lying is a skill. Eh? And then she says, someone called and said, you know, that I couldn't even explain to her what had happened. But just looking back, you know, at, at, at those things, childhood wounds, and I don't know what, this aspect of childhood wounds brings to you. I've shared the other bigger wounds. These are the smaller ones that I'm sharing now. But the Holy Spirit was just reminding me this morning that you know prayer is a call. When you feel the need to pray, it's a call. So um, you, you enter into the presence of God. You've been called into the presence of God. You know, you've been ushered into the presence of God. And Hebrews 4.16 says, Come therefore boldly before the throne of grace, so that you may receive mercy and find help in your time of need. One of my favorite scriptures. The Lord has also shown me through just heavenly, um, being taken into heaven, how Satan approaches the throne of grace. That he doesn't do it um, confidently the way we do. He comes very, very scared into the presence of God. And if, as a child of God, you come scared into the presence of God, or you come, and I know we are told to come reverently, but reverently a lot of times doesn't, I don't think it was ever explained to us as, you know, knowing that God is, is, is fire, is a consuming fire, etc., etc., etc. But then we are living in an age where Jesus died on the cross, and so the veil was rent already. So when we come, we're supposed to come to spend time with our father, to come and spend time with our big brother, to come and spend time with the king, and of course, spending time with the spirit of the living God. But it's fellowship. It's fellowship. It's something, it's a gift. Prayer is a gift. And it's something that we've been given to enjoy. Prayer is supposed to be an enjoyable time. And by the way, I found a direct correlation between when I pray and whether I'm anxious or not. I found that when I pray, I'm not 
anxious about anything. When I pray, I have courage. When I pray, I'm able to go out and just do just about anything by faith without being afraid. But if I don't pray, I begin to worry. I begin to think about, oh my, you know, I begin to think about things like, you know, things that we were taught in, as children. And we were taught, uh, you know, I remember my mom's voice. And this morning, I don't know why it was so loud. My mom always used to say, if you don't work, you don't eat. And I've not been employed for the last um, 10 months. And, you know, this morning I woke up and said, thinking, oh gosh, oh gosh, maybe I need to get a job, you know, for like two, three seconds. And then the Holy Spirit tells me, but you have a job. And you were working yesterday, which was Sunday. And by the way, you've been working for several weeks without rest. And you're getting exhausted because you're working and you're working in my vineyard. Uh, but you see... It's, it was never factored in that, you know, being employed, uh, being, being working for the Lord is working, isn't it? And so you find yourself thinking, oh, you don't work, you don't eat. And the Holy Spirit reminds me, I will supply all your needs according to my riches in glory. But what was it? I hadn't entered into prayer. But when I entered into prayer, all those things just began to disappear. I had a poster in my room when I was in campus that said, um... Uh, it's actually a song. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glorious face or glory and grace. I don't even remember. But turn your eyes upon Jesus. So when you come to pray, the things of the earth become strangely dim. That's just how the Lord orchestrated prayer. That in the place of prayer, when we pray, we have peace. When we pray, we have joy. When we pray, we the presence of the Lord comes and dwells amongst us and everything just doesn't seem um, difficult anymore. When you look at weed, I hear people, yes, I said weed. When you look at weed, I hear people saying that when you smoke weed, I don't know, even a table looks like a stool and you can throw it. Well, I guess Jesus is my weed, you know? Because when I spend time in the presence of God, the biggest of things seem like nothing no matter what is trying to shake me up so long as I'm in the presence of God and I'm in prayer and I'm prayed up it doesn't matter what the devil may send because the things of the earth are nothing because when you come before the Lord you look full in his glorious face you spend time with him and in that moment, you are actually in heaven. And when you spend time in heaven, you realize how earth is nothing to the Lord. He created it by a word. So what is it? He can destroy it by just a word. And then he reminds you that you are his and you spend time in the presence of the Lord. But then our childhood wounds will interfere with that sometimes. So you'll find that as we grew up, we really didn't like spend time with our parents. We really didn't spend time with them playing with our parents and, you know, uh, socializing with them and everything you know we ran away you know when they'd come through the door would flee to the bedroom you know would carry the things that they were carrying and we look through and of course even if it's things like bread you knew that a loaf of bread had to last like three days and so therefore you could you would be happy that the loaf of bread had come it would be more like tasting bread isn't it you know and and whatever it is if it's sausages or whatever it is you know we would know that they were eaten on Sundays you know um, and you had to eat just one sausage and sometimes it had to be a half a sausage you know and for some people maybe you never knew do you know, by the way, for the longest time, my dad would come with yogurt when we were children in the 80s, and my dad would come with yogurt, and I used to call it pink milk. So for me, I believe it was, it was pink milk. Even the other day, I said it to my husband, I said, there's some other pink milk my dad used to come with that was so yummy. And then my husband said, don't you think perhaps it was yogurt? And I stopped and I was like, and it hit me, the taste. Yes, of course, it was yogurt. <laughs> But it was in a polythene bag, and I don't know where Dad used to get it from. Maybe it was Delamere because we had a farm in Naivasha. But for the longest time, I thought of it as pink milk. So sometimes it'd come with fish. Sometimes it'd come with game or whatever it is. Shh, he would. You know, but, you know, because he was a soldier in the wilderness, and they'll, they'll get game. I don't know how they got it, but, well, anyway. So, um... But then just looking at all those things as you, as, as, as you grow up, the scarcity, the, that good things, you know, will come only if you behave yourself. I remember once I told my mom that she's not my mother. 
And then my mom, you know, being the wise woman that she was, she decided she wasn't going to argue. She wasn't going to react. She said she was going to teach me a lesson. So what did she do? She went to her bag and she picked up coins, coins, coins. And she sent my cousin for bread. And she sent my cousin for, I think it was Sprite. Of course, it was Sprite. I'll never forget. She sent her for Sprite and I think uh, a Fanta. And then I was like, woohoo. I hadn't related it with my behavior. Then it's all brought. And those days you would not eat bread and soda unless it was Christmas. You know, the bread could come, but bread and soda on the same day. Oh my goodness, a treat. And if you haven't eaten bread and soda together, by the way, they go very well together. Of course, you you really put on a lot of weight because, you know, very unhealthy stuff there. But it's a really, really yummy taste. But so mom sends and then, you know, we're waiting anxiously and it's brought and we're all excited. And, you know, the mood would change in the house because, you know, bread is on the way. And of course, you know, now it's soda as well. And we're wondering what the celebration is. Did we forget something or whatever it is? Then it comes and my mom begins to share it out amongst my siblings. And I come with my little cup and my mom tells me, I think you need to go to your mom so that she can give you the soda um, that she has bought for you. Because, you know, my child, this is for my child. This is for my children. Let me tell you, repentance has never come quickly like that. I cried. I said how sorry I was. And uh, she was kind enough to forgive me. And uh, I was able to partake a smaller portion because, of course, people had really eaten it and finished it. And, and uh, I hadn't. So, I mean, just looking back also just at those things that even how repentance came, how punishment came, how those things came, you know, and... <laughs> Pastor Terry, I tell you, you know, but just looking back at all those things, you know, they actually affect you and they affect how you approach God and they affect how you think of God. So this morning, you know, after an amazing time yesterday, after serving the Lord yesterday, after being there for the Lord yesterday, this morning I get into the place of prayer. And of course, there's still the Catholic uh, training of all those years. I mean, I was Catholic for 19 years. That's a long time. And it was my formative years. So things like you're taught about how you cannot just come to God, you have to do penance and all those things. If you have not confessed, you cannot take communion. And you know, it was serious stuff, you know? And so, I come to kneel before the Lord and I enter in through worship and suddenly I realize that there's this intense guilt, intense guilt like I've done something wrong. So I'm searching my heart, I'm asking the Holy Spirit to search my heart and the Holy Spirit says there's nothing. And he says, we are pleased with you, we love you, you know, and, and um, you know, we, 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 we are there for you, you know, the Spirit of God. Oh, hi, Mary, good to see you. Oh, my goodness, that's my cousin from um, all the way in Australia. Love you, honey, I miss you. I hope you're coming home soon. Um, and um, so just looking at this whole thing, and, and the Holy Spirit says there's nothing. And I'm not saying that I was without sin, yeah? But he allowed me to see no sin in me this morning and tell me, change how you come into my presence. And I realize it's true. You know, and I'm a servant of God and I feel that way. So how about the rest of us? Will we come before God because we're in need? Will we come before God because we need, there's a problem? Will we come before God and fear that we're gonna be struck? You know, there's a story that I was told at some point and it, it's a biblical story in the Old Testament. When the priests went to the, before the presence of God, they tied a bell around their feet and, and a rope so that if things were thick, they would just pull on the rope. And if they, by thick, I mean they'd get into the presence of God and they'd find that God is angry with Israel and was ready to destroy them. They would try to ring the bell so that they are pulled very quickly out of the presence of God. Of course, if God wanted to destroy them, he would destroy them there and then, you know? Um, but then, you know, they, they, they got to escape sometimes, you know, but as I look at it, there's a sense in which as a priest, that is so ingrained in me. And it's a good thing in terms of not taking the presence of God for granted. It's a good thing in terms of fearing the Lord, but it's a bad thing in terms of that you just carry this guilt with you, you know, and, and when you come to the place of prayer, it can actually become a veil. You know, the veil that was already rent, it can become a veil. So we need to be able to, two things that the Lord is saying to us this morning, we need to be able to learn to come into the place of prayer with boldness, come before the throne of grace, with boldness, with confidence, that we may be able to receive mercy and find help in our time of need, but also be able to fellowship with God, 
not from a place of trouble, not from a place of, of, of that we are having issues, not from a place of, I need your help, God, but from a place where you know very well that I'm coming because I need you, Lord, and I just want to spend time with you. I want to fellowship with you. I want to interact with you. I want to love you. I want you to work on me. I want your presence to rub off on me that, you know, I'd be like you. I want to learn from you. I want to serve you. You know, it's not from a place of help me, help me, help me. Yeah? So that's one thing. The Lord wants us to come before his throne. Not just when we have problems, but prayer becomes a habit. Because God is our friend, because God is our king, and it's also a place of obedience. And we realize that we need to pray so that we can have strength for every day and so that we can honor the Lord in everything. Then the second thing is just to get rid of the guilt. So the get rid of the guilt of feeling as though, you know, when we come before God, he's angry with us. He has an issue with us. Some of us think that Angel Gabriel stands with uh, an eraser, you know, um, and, and blotting out our, you know, our name from the book of life when we sin and then writing it back on and then blotting it out and then writing it back on. And we think that Angel Gabriel has nothing else to do and God is nasty like that and it's based on our childhood wounds it's based on our childhood wounds and the Lord has been reminding me especially this week that he loves me and that he loves us and that you know his love uh, is not even because you're born again you can deny the son of God and God still loves you you know he will still love you because he created you and he loves us you know the Lord loves us and we need to allow that to seep in because a lot of us don't believe that we can be loved a lot of us don't believe that we there's anything to love about us and what is it about because in our formative years we never got to hear our parents say I love you we never get, got to hear our parents tell us you're great. We never got to hear our parents tell us you're beautiful. We never got to hear our parents saying, good job, unless maybe you brought in good grades, you know? And even when you brought in good grades, a lot of times your parents would be focused more on the D that you brought and not the A's that you brought, you know? And they'll be comparing us with our siblings and everything. And the thing is, by the way, we need to forgive our parents because they didn't have Google, they didn't have parenting lessons, and they came from an era where their parents had been in, you know, Mau Mau, they'd been caught up in the colonial times and, and the parents before them were illiterate. And we need to just cut them some slack because they did the best that they knew how. The other day, my daughter came home, our last born, she came home, she just joined a new school and she came home and the school has um, a mixture of older children and younger children. And well, you know, cause younger children, if you look at it, toddlers, you know, cause she was a toddler at the time, toddlers, um, there's a shape that they have. Their body has a certain shape. They all have big heads and then their bodies look very small. Their torsos look very small. And then of course they have big stomachs, all of them pretty much. And of course a lot of them are chubby. Yeah, but pretty much that's how they are. All toddlers are just, that's how they are. It's part of the development stage. Their heads really look big compared to the rest of their bodies. And my little girl, so they wouldn't tease each other based on that. Cause they all look like that so when I look in the mirror they all look like that but we took her to a place where there were older children and younger children and we hadn't preempted this and for the parents who maybe are hearing this for the first time preempt it and prepare your child to be able to recognize their age and where they are at and everything so my little girl comes home and asks mom what's a tumbo and I feel a dread in my spirit as she's asking this and then um, so I tell her um, it's a stomach you know and then she said, I thought so. And she looked down and she looked so broken. So I asked her, what is it about your tumbo, you know, stomach? You know, what is it about your stomach? And she says, well, this girl told me I have a big tumbo. And I said, well, baby, you do. But then so does everyone your age. But it, it's like, by the time I was reaching her, the harm had been done. And I kind of just went through it quickly because um, I was driving. I guess I was also a bit, you know, distracted. But I also didn't realize how much it had affected her. Until a few weeks later, I hear my nanny saying, stop it, stop it. And I'm like, what is it? And she comes and she tells me there's something happening with your little girl. She, nowadays, she's been hiding food and throwing it in the dustbin. So I go and I sit down with my little girl. And then suddenly the Holy Spirit reminds me about the tumbo comment, yeah, the stomach comment, the big stomach comment. And I realized that my little girl is actually not eating her food and she's throwing it away and hiding it. And what she's trying to do is to lose weight. 
So this is teenagers for you, you know, and preteens for you that, you know, having a big stomach is a big issue because, of course, of the models that they've seen on TV and the newspapers and, of course, their, their, their parents um, who are telling them that, oh, you know, I have a big stomach and that's a big bad thing. And so she picks on the little girl and tells her, you have a big stomach. And my little girl suddenly is trying to lose weight. And she's lost a lot of weight, by the way. And, um, you know, I've just been taking a lot of time to just let her know that she's beautiful. But she was cast out of her toddler age very quickly to begin to think that her definition comes from having a flat stomach. And we need to be very, very alert with our children, yeah? We need to be very alert with our children. We need to be aware of how our children are and how they are growing up. And we need to be very alert and look out for the wounds and to look out for the lie that Satan will try to introduce. I mean, Satan has no shame. He will tell your two-year-old they have a big stomach and that they are ugly because they have a big stomach. He will even go down to the place of telling your little child, you know, that they, they don't, their butt is flat or whatever it is or they don't have a big enough backside. And your child will have issues and you wonder what are they supposed to do about their backside you know what are they supposed to do about genetics what are they supposed to do about their hair that's not growing what are they gonna do about their skin color what are they gonna do about the size of their lips what are they gonna do about the size of their bust a lot of these things are very very genetic and if we're not careful these wounds really really define us <laughs> my grandfather clock is at it it's gonna ring for a bit, it's 10 o'clock. Just give it a moment to finish. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. it's done doing its work <laughs> if you haven't watched the video i'm talking about the grandfather clock then you'll understand the joke um but yeah if uh, and, and and here's the thing you'll find somebody with a gift of worship but they can't stand in front of people you find somebody with a calling of god on their lives and they cannot preach you know and um even personally for me, when the Lord told me to go on to the online broadcast, I was saying, God, not my face, not my face, not anything but my face. You know, I tried to find things like podcasts and everything, and I didn't know how to do it and everything. And it's just that I've learned to obey the Lord because I grew up being called ugly duckling, you know, by one of my siblings who swears she never did that, you know. But it was just something that Satan planted on her. And I grew up thinking I'm ugly, you know, and I don't look good. And therefore, of course, Satan already knew that I was going to, be a preacher, I was going to be a minister of the gospel. So he needed to try and destroy my opinion of how I look so that I may think that, you know, my preaching has anything to do with how I look. It's got nothing to do with our looks at all because it's not about us, it's about the Lord, you know. But you see the lies that Satan will try and plant. And then so just look out for wounds in your life, you know, and look out in the wounds you will find lies and in the lies you will find wounds. And then the, the next step is to ask God to reveal to you when this door was opened and when this wound was introduced or when this lie was introduced in your life, the Holy Spirit will take you to the, 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 the early childhood every time because a lot of these wounds are in the early childhood. And then in that early childhood, the Lord will be able to reveal to you um, what lie was introduced in that place. You can forgive the person who introduced the lie. You should, you must, by the way, to be able to be free, you must forgive the person who introduced the lie. And in some cases, the person who should have been there to protect you from that lie, who should have been there to affirm you and to tell you how you look and that you're important and everything. Most of the time, this is daddy. And uh, daddies are the ones who give us our identity. Yeah. Or, you know, in terms of teaching, it'll be mommy who's supposed to be teaching and to nurture and to comfort you. And you take time to forgive them that they were not there, that they, they did not, um, you know, encourage you. And it helps to think of the fact that they didn't maybe know about it, you know, so that when you're forgiving, it's easier to forgive that way. So once you have forgiven, then you renounce the lie that Satan has introduced. And then once you renounce the lie, um, 
Once you renounce the lie, then you're able to ask God to tell you what the truth is to replace that lie. And then you begin to speak the truth and to proclaim the truth about that aspect. You know, that it could be that you're fearfully and wonderfully made, that you're the apple of God's ever loving eye. One of the things that amazes me, especially whenever I comb my hair, is the reminder from the Lord that he counts even the hairs on our heads. And if even one falls off, he actually notices that you've lost two strands of hair, you've lost four strands of hair, you've lost 500 strands of hair or whatever it is. But every aspect of us, the Lord really cares about. So it's very, very critical that we deal with our wounds um, and you begin to walk in the truth of who God says you are. And we must not get caught up in, oh God, I'm so wounded, you know? And when you watch these videos, it will hurt. It will hurt. Why? Because the Lord is speaking very directly into your life. This is a rema word. This is something that the Lord is ministering to his church right now. And he is just helping us to clean house so that then uh, we can be able to receive from him. You know, I'm going to go back again to sharing of a time when I used to pray with about five people. There were about maybe six or seven people actually. About six or seven people. And we prayed every day for revival. 2013, 2014, we prayed every day for revival. Sometimes we'd meet in the morning pray for revival, then we'd meet at lunchtime, pray for revival, then pray in the evening for revival, and would weep before God would fast. We're going to 40 days of prayer and fasting. As I look back now, I'm learning that a lot of Christians, when you call a fast, they don't fast. They just lie that they're fasting and would, you know, be on the floor calling on the Lord and crying to God and weeping before God. Morning, noon, uh, evening, night, you know, we'll just be calling on God and our cry was revival, revival, 2013, 2014. And then one day, as we were pitching a tent, suddenly we noticed that our compound, our, 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 uh, where we are, uh, I'm trying to learn the, the word to use for compound because Americans and, you know, guys in the West don't have a word compound. So this is where your house is, you know, um, the, the area. So we noticed that the place where the church um, environment was, which was in uh, Kilelesho at the time, that it had light. And our light was not working, so it had light. But then the next uh, um, house next to us and the other ones around us, they were dark, you know, even though they had light, but there was darkness, but there was no darkness in the place where we were, the compound where we were, um, you know, there was no darkness. It was bright as day, you know, and it was like the sun was shining. And um, suddenly we looked up and we realized that there was a, a white, bright, brighter than a fluorescent light, bright white rectangle just above us where we were pitching the tent and the light was coming from heaven it's like heaven was completely open let me tell you the people i've been praying with for pretty much almost a year um day and night 2013 into 2014 all of a sudden they scattered they scattered the rain for shelter. They hid under the tent. They hid under all sorts of places. As I look back, it's funny now. But at that time, I cried. I went and got into the car and I cried. Because, of course, the moment that we did that, the glory that was above us disappeared. Because that's the Holy Spirit. He's grieved so easily. And he withdrew. And darkness fell over the compound. And I thought that was revival that was falling right now. And I got into the car and I drove and I cried all the way home and I cried the whole night and I cried for several days, you know. And the thing is, when we don't understand who God is to us and who we are to him, when revival comes, we will flee. We will cry for revival. But when the glory of God comes, the wounds that we have where we think we're not good enough, the wounds that we have where we think there's something wrong with us, the wounds that we have, which by the way, also cause us to live a life of sin. When you're a wounded person, you will live a life of sin. Whether it's the sin where you are angry with yourself and you have low self-worth and you're suicidal, which is a sin, um, or whether it is, um, you know, just thinking that other people are better than you and you don't deserve the glory of God. And so you gauge yourself based on human beings and the lies of childhood or whether it is that you think God's mad at you or whether it is that, you know, as a result of the wounds you have, you're now walking in sexual sin, fornication, lying, um, you know, taking shortcuts and bribing when it comes to business because you don't think God can come through for you. Those wounds will define how you're walking and normally a wound will cause you to walk outside of the will of God and the purpose of God for your life. And did you know that doubting the love of God, that praying and thinking that God's not going to come through for you, that even coming 
with humble words like saying, God, if you have a moment for me, that that is actually sin. Because you insult the personality of God. You insult the person of God. You insult the character of God. And indeed, you negate the word of God that says that he has loved us with an everlasting love. That says that as far as the east is from the west, so far has he taken our sin from us. That his ways are higher than our ways. That his love, he, 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 we are the apple of God's ever-loving eye. That our, our, our names are engraved on the palm of his hand. That we are made in the likeness of God. We are negated all that and sometimes by the way it looks like humility but it's a false humility it's what I think it's Isaiah who talks about a false piety a false piety so we we think that we are pious we think that we 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 are really being holy when we put ourselves down when you say God I'm such a sinner I have failed in so many ways and 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 you know the other day my husband was reading a Catholic prayer and, and, and I, I do not wish that Catholics would catch feelings, but he read a Catholic prayer and he said, man, sometimes Catholic prayers are just amazing because my husband was a Catholic too. So he reads out the Catholic prayer and I wish I'd written it down, but it says, God, let your grace be upon us and let your goodness uh, fall perpetually on us. Uh, let your light shine on us every time, even as, as we look uh, unto you. And then it says, and, and let your grace be even more upon those who need your grace more than others. And you're like, who are these people who need God's grace more than others? And it sounds so nice. And that's one of the things I loved about the Catholic Church. And I'm a words person, you know, for me, you know, words are a big deal. And, and so uh, there were these poetic written prayers and these poetic written things and, and, and would, 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 you know, would, would repeat them and say them. But what they did is that they made us feel so guilty and rotten and like there's something wrong with us. Although, by the way, they didn't make us, they, they helped us not to have this entitlement that a lot of Pentecostals have. Because I find that a lot of Pentecostals have a lot of entitlement. Like someone owes them something, like someone should do something for them. That is the, the, the complete opposite of what we grew up in. And we just grew up in thinking that if the Lord, you know, we said, God, you know, grant us your grace, you know, and, and, and if the Lord just granted us his grace, we'll be just so thankful that God granted us his grace, you know, instead of just looking at it as, oh, my dad's calling me, by the blood of Jesus, his grace is given unto us, okay? So by the blood of Jesus, the grace is there and it's given for free and, 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 so you see how Satan walks in lies, eh? and he just brings things and introduces things, and we are so sinful, and we are so fallen, and we are so, you know, fallen out of the grace of God, and we are so, you know, we're such sinners, and we exalt our sinnership so much uh, that we, we fail to receive the Lord, you know, and the grace of God. And I look at things like the way of the cross that we were brought up in, and we'd stand at every station thinking about how Jesus was pierced and how he was hurt. And by the time you were done, you felt so guilty and so worthless and so horrible. And the focus was on the death of Jesus, not on his resurrection, not on the wonder of that um, the Lord would love us, God would love us enough to send his only son. You know, and, and a lot of these religious things, they're just designed so much to help you, to make you focus on your guilt and on feeling like there's something wrong with you. Yeah. Amen. God bless you. Work on those wounds, guys. And how do you work on the wounds? Remember, you must go before the Lord. Weep, by the way. Weep. But they, you know, God created us to grieve, eh? As in, and the Bible talks about grieving the Holy Spirit. So when you find out that something wounded you in your childhood, you will feel sad. You will cry. I've had people forward me wailing, you know, and uh, just all they're doing is wailing and weeping as they realize that even the marriage they're in, they got into it because they were wounded. Uh, but then what you do, you're not going to leave your husband because now you realize, oh, I was wounded. You know, I deserve better. I was not going to get better if, uh, you know, if I, I, I had truly uh, grown up knowing that I deserve better. The Lord will redeem wherever you are. But you must take time. Weep before the Lord. Pray before the Lord. Repent before the Lord. Let the Lord help you um, to um, work on those wounds and grieve about them. But forgive the person who introduced the wound. Forgive the person who should have been there to protect you from the wound. Renounce the lie that Satan introduced in that wound. The Holy Spirit will tell you what lie you have believed. Because for a wound to continue to operate in your life, then there's a lie that you have believed. And on this one, I always share, I have been raped. 
but I'm not caught up in that rape that it affects me, it affects my husband, it affects my relationship with men and those kind of things, you know, uh, just because I was raped, because I renounced the lie that had been introduced as a result of the rape. Of course, I did it 10 years later, but you know, um, actually much more than that, I think it was 2012 that I did. But, you know, renounce the lie and then ask God to show you what the truth is to replace that lie and then begin to proclaim the truth about who you are in God and what you are lied to about who you are not in God. And you are told, you know, that, you know, there are others, you know, like for us, we grew up being told only the priests can read the Bible. And it's one of the lies I have to renounce. No. I am more than able through the Holy Spirit to understand the Bible. It's not just the priest who can read the Bible and understand the Bible. If without reading the Word of God, I will die because the Word of God is life. I have to live inside of the Word. I have to move inside of the Word. I have to grow inside of the Word. The Word of God is everything. I have to operate in the Word of God. If I don't operate in the Word of God, I'll be deceived. So I have to read the Bible and the Word of God, you know? And by the way, I've also bought so many Bibles and different versions, and I just love to eat up the Word of God. So you ask God to help you in that, and then, of course, to grow in the things of God. So get out of those wounds. Stop getting caught up in, I'm wounded. Cry, but don't live there. And when you cry, ask the Holy Spirit to come and comfort you. Ask him to come and encourage you because, you know, until you're truly, truly grieving, you never know the comfort of the Holy Spirit. He's a wonderful comforter. And by the way, you'll even feel him wrapping you in his arms. You may feel like a warm blanket around you. Sometimes you'll come in a, a, a breeze. You know, sometimes you will feel like a warmth around you. That's how he comes. So don't get caught up in trying to close a window and wondering what is that window and what is that feeling I'm getting and everything. That's the Holy Spirit coming to comfort you so that you know that you don't mourn alone anymore. More. You might have mourned alone when you were little, and it's just that you didn't know that Jesus was right there with you, but you don't mourn alone anymore. So weep through it, relive it, but relive it right now through the blood of Jesus, and the Holy Spirit will walk with you, go back to that place, and remember what was done to you, and forgive. Forgive, forgive, forgive. Just say, I choose to forgive. If it's too hard, say, I choose to forgive. Because for as long as you don't forgive, then you are also bound. And you're actually tormented. And the Bible says in Matthew 21, Matthew 18, verse 21 to 35, it says, if you don't forgive others, then the Lord will also not forgive you. And you don't want to be in that situation and that circumstance. And then if it's about marriage, we will have another discussion. Hopefully tomorrow, as the Lord enables us, I'll talk about when you're wounded and you're in a marriage and you're wounded. And we are entering into the series about praying for marriages and we're going to wage war against marriages and I'm going to tell you one thing I know I'm able to proclaim the way Jesus proclaims that father I know you hear me so guess what when we begin to pray against the enemies of marriage you better not be one of the enemies of marriage because your life is going to fall apart so hard you won't believe it when we begin to pray against the enemies of marriage so if you're the married man or you're the married woman whether they're separated or whatever it is you know if you're not there it gives them the opportunity to be able to heal but if you're there providing extracurricular activity, providing a sideshow, providing, you know, much needed ego lifting, then the person cannot go back to his family. The woman cannot go back to her husband because you are there becoming a crutch for them. But if you're not there, then they are able to think and to go back to the Lord. We're actually beginning at 21 days of waging war for marriages because people are crying. Men have had their wives stolen from them by men, other men who have money or have something that they don't have. Women have, you know, have had their husbands stolen by a woman with a better looking body or a better look personality or with money as well or whatever it is or using witchcraft. And we are beginning 21 days of waging total and absolute war against the enemies of marriage, these strange women that have come into marriage, these strange men that have come into marriage. And I know, I'll, by the way, let me tell you, guaranteed, for you to enter somebody's marriage, you're actually a wounded person. You are. You're a wounded person. So if it's for the girls who are dating married men, it's that you didn't have a father or your father hurt you, and you're actually looking for a father figure. Who else would go out with a mbaba? Yeah? Who else would go out with a kibaba? Because, I mean, our husbands, uh, well, they, they may be working out, like mine is working out and everything, but a lot of them are just out of shape. They are not attractive. They are old. They are balding. They're 
but they have money, I guess, you know, so, and maybe love. And, you know, some woman has worked on him and suddenly he is a different man. He's caring. He's not who he is. And the thing is, you would never have fallen in love with him back in the day when he had nothing. That is a fact. And what you need to deal with is your daddy's wound. Others, you're going to come against the mighty man of war who is Jehovah, and yet you're already so wounded. Please pack up and leave that woman's house flee change your phone number you might have a child with that person but you can have an account where the, where the person makes the payment into the child's account and you know the the cares of the child are taken care of because the child is innocent however you just need to leave that other woman's home and that other woman's husband it is time and you know it is time okay and i will do a proper appeal before we begin warfare you know, I will do a proper appeal. I will. It's the least that we can do because the devastation that's going to come to you and even those babies you had with the wrong person, with the married man, they, they, that you're using now, they could die. They could die. Remember David and Bathsheba? They could die. We, and, and, and we don't want that to happen to you. So please, we are also giving you just vacation notice. Just vacate. 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 Of course, we're going to fight against the demons uh, that are operating in marriages, but there are some human beings too who are operating in marriages. There's no blessing in being in someone else's marriage. Amen. God bless you guys. Wonderful to see you, Pastor Nick. Just as you're tuning in, it must be very, very late in Delaware. I miss you, bro. Let's talk sometime. You're very good at reaching out, so call me so that we can just catch up and everything god bless you it's lovely to see you just tuning in so many friends also um it's wonderful to see you family members as well let me get off my dad has just tried calling me let me call him and find out i told you i'm a daddy's girl i need to find out why daddy's looking for me i think i have a plot for today yes although we are fasting so i can't eat nyamachoma normally our plot with dad is to eat nyamachoma so let me call my daddy i'm actually so excited i get so excited when my dad calls so let me call him he's probably in the area and we need to hook up god bless you guys I Thank God for my dad. He spoiled me in so many ways. I mean, there are things by the way my husband will do. I said, mm -mm, I'm daddy's princess. You're not going to do that to me. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. God bless you guys. Amen. Shalom. Let's keep working out our salvation, okay? And read the word of God and live in the word of God. I love you and I'm praying for you.